Head to Subway for the tangy new Tuscan Chicken Melt, seasoned chicken melted cheese and olive vinaigrette. With 9 grams of fat, it's part of a Subway fresh fit meal. A simpler way to enjoy eating better. Hurry in today. Subway. Eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife. Cutting through a well-aged state. Now. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. All right, back in the BS Report. This is part two of my podcast with Chuck Klosterman. In part one, we talked about Michael Jackson, and we started talking about Twitter and a whole bunch of other things, and then it gravitated to what we're about to talk about now. Me and Chuck Klosterman, he's on the Subway Fresh Take Hotline. Here we go. Let me ask you this. So okay. you're saying that you're tired of... You're, you know, people thinking that you're only writing about, I'm sure you get a ton of like 902 and I'll say by the bell, heavy metal, all that kind of stuff. So what's your next move to get away from that? Well, I mean, I, I'm not saying you can get away from it. I mean, some of that, you're, it's sort of like what you said, to a degree, some of those subjects are just things that I write about. Okay. Yeah, cause but you I like am, them, cause I you am, like them, though. but I am, yes, but I also am, I, I, I okay, uh, I guess I have, I, mean, I have a book, a new book of essays coming out in October, right. and you know I, I assume that then it will shift, and then maybe the queries will be about the things in this book. And as long as you keep generating new subjects, you keep generating new ideas, that that hopefully those things will shift. Yeah, but you have the luxury of basically writing a book every two years and a couple of magazine pieces, but that's it. So you can pick and choose what people read from you. Some well, of us don't have that luxury. What so I'm gonna I'm gonna have I'm gonna say my hit or miss potential not miss but I'm gonna write about stuff sometimes that I'm a hundred percent passionate about and other times I'm writing because it's round two of the NBA playoffs and I got to come up with some angles. And and is there a I guess I've never asked you this is yeah. there an, a, a number of pieces you have to write per month for ESPN like contractually? No. So then why are you obligated then to write about things you're not interested in? I never write about anything. Or are there things that you're not motivated to uh, intrinsically, or like naturally? I am always motivated to write about whatever idea. My problem is if I'm not motivated to write about an idea, usually I won't write anything. And that's happened a few times where it just, you know, like sometimes it helps you to have like the Friday in NFL season. I know I have to write every Friday. And that makes my brain really work on trying to come up with different things. But... You know, if I didn't have that Friday NFL deadline every week during the season, would I come up with half the things? I don't know. So I almost feel like I need that deadline to yeah. to come up with to force you know, you to trigger sort of, parts of my yeah. brain that maybe wouldn't have been triggered otherwise. Um, but at other times, I, most of the time, it's easy. You know, my issue now is, and I'm sure you've dealt with this too, is writing has gotten so niche oriented now. Everybody is an expert on everything. And you can't just casually come in and say, here's my baseball column, and have, like, a few facts wrong because you'll get annihilated. Well, but, so, you're, you're, I, I find like, but isn't that an example of where you're, that like, okay, you're being a, what you're saying, like, if you get facts wrong, you're saying, or if you, or if the idea is weak. Cause we I think, think it's a combo. I'm saying in 1995, you could write a baseball column with a weak idea with facts that were screwed up, and... Nobody was going to call you on it because who was out there? There's no internet. People would read the column and be like, that was stupid, and that's it. That's the last time they think of it. If you write a baseball column now in 2009 or a football column or a basketball column or any column, and you just can't throw stuff up, and you have to have command of it. You know what I mean? And I think that's where people get in trouble where they're like, uh, I, I'm gonna write a I'm gonna write a column about the NBA finals, and they have no idea really what angle they're going to come up with. And it ends up being dumb. So I think that's for me. That's the biggest fear. So would you argue that that email and Twitter and all the avenues for people to respond to media have improved column writing? Do you think column writing is better now than it was twenty twenty years ago? I think I think our country is more literate than it was twelve years ago, and I can tell you firsthand, like you know, the first two years I had my website, and it was only on AOL, and I'd get these AOL emails, and they would be in caps. They'd be in all caps. 
or they'd be hundred misspellings or the, you know the most of the emails I get now are pretty literate, and I just think the fact that people are blackberrying or they're on email or they're doing this or that or they're texting um it's mo- it's motivated that part of their brain that they just write better. Does that make sense? Well, it's raised a kind of literacy. I mean, it, it, I don't know if it, I, I, I guess it's, I still, in, in, the, in, the, in the conditions you're describing, that is, maybe that is true. I don't know. I, I mean, you'll get Well, I mean, obviously that. texting and that LOL stuff like that, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying like, you, you think about like what you and I, how you and I grew up and we loved writing. How many people did you know who actually wrote stuff other than term papers and things they had to write? Not that oh, many. Oh, that's true. That's totally true. I mean, now people are writing thing. nonstop. They're constantly communicating through their fingers, which is the big difference between now and 1997. Okay. Speaking of nonstop writing, here was something else I wanted to ask you about. Um, okay. Wait a second. Can we talk about my career some more? Well, it is about your career. Because well, I was why can't we book. talk about I, your I wanted, career? I want to talk to you about your book. That's Let's talk. About, you're in my book. I, I know, but I haven't seen it. I, I want. There's something I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. Well, I don't want um, to give my book away, though. Well, okay, but here's what I'm curious about. Okay, yeah. the one thing that that has been heavily promoted about this, just naturally over the internet, is the size of the book. Okay, it's like 700 and what two pages or something. I, I think it's going to be less than that, actually. Well, this is what I'm it's curious a big book, about. Yeah. What was your thinking in having the book that size, knowing that certainly it was going to limit the number of people who were going to read all of it, even the people who are the, your biggest fans? I don't know if that's necessarily true. That's a lot to ask of people to read a 700-page book. That's basically like because there are people who you know like were like I love David Halberstam's The Fifties. I skipped over a part about you know yeah it's it's, it's, good, it's a lot to ask of people too. Well, I think but well, here would be my counter. I think it's a different kind of book. It's not something that you can fit. You're not you're not going to bring it into the Bahamas and read it in two days. It's not that kind of book. It's a book that you can jump in and out of and enjoy. My whole thinking was, I hate making people pay for my stuff. I've always hated it. It's just, you know, I, I've been in the place where I didn't have a lot of money. I don't want to, I don't want people to have to pay for my stuff unless, unless it's really good or if it's something they're not normally getting. And with this book, I easily could have split it up into two volumes. But what, what am I going to charge people? So I split it up into two 341 page books. Well, I mean, and I ask people to basically pay for it twice, but really the book is going to be better altogether. Then why wouldn't I do that? Well, but I know, but you're kind of that's kind of like Axel talking about the use your illusion records. I mean, you also could have made the book 450 pages, and the other stuff you could have put on your website to promote it for free. But you haven't read the book yet. I haven't. I, I'm waiting for you to send me a galley. I'm not saying that it's not worth 700 pages, but it's a kind of. I'm sure your publisher expressed some fear over the size of that book. And but how one, that of, but one of the reasons, though, that it's that length is because there's footnotes for everything. Are the and footnotes at the bottom or in the back? On the bottom. And okay, that good, extends the length. Good. Yeah. It's. It's. Uh, I don't think it reads like a seven page. 100 page book i really don't i think it's you know i've i've read 450 page books that read like 700 page books Mm -hmm. and i've read other bigger books that read like smaller books but my whole thing is i don't really care like it's the book i wanted to write it's i think people will like it and what can you do are you so are you would you would you say you're unnervous about its reception i you know what this is weird but i don't really care like I, somebody, there's something there, and one of my bosses was like, "Well, you got to worry that the reviews will be." And I don't, know, whatever, review it the way you want. This is the book I wanted to write. I hope people like it. Does that sound weird? Oh no, I mean I think that's a good attitude. I mean it's it's hard to I mean it's hard to imagine someone writing a book though and honestly not caring about the response. I mean I would say that about my book too, but it's not really true. Of course, to a degree. I oh, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not saying I don't care if it sells really well and I won't be upset if nobody buys it. But at a certain point, it's out of your hands. It's like sending a kid off to college. I spent three years on it. It's the best book I can do. I said everything I wanted to say. I had a choice of splitting it up into two volumes or one. And I just think it it's, reads better as a one volume book. I don't want to make people buy two books. So there you go. My next one, uh, you know, will be shorter. I can what, do that much. <laughs> if, you, if you had to pick one of these two scenarios, which would you rather have? Yeah. That the book is, is widely received as like the definitive book about uh, basketball in America and the history of the NBA, and it sells 4,500 copies. Or it sells, uh, you know, 400,000 copies, but it is sort of dismissed critically. And that's a lot of... 
people, you know, a lot of people who respond and say, like, well, it's just like reading his column in book form. But I already answered that. I don't care. But what if you had to have one of the two? But I already, my scenario already played out. It's the, it's the book I wanted to write, and it's, it's the link that made the most sense, and it's the best book. So like, maybe, having, yeah. wait, like, all right, for instance, you, you wrote a, a, a fictional novel mm-hmm. called Downtown Owl. Mm-hmm. I, when you pitched that novel to the people of your publishing company, I doubt they were doing backflips because it was a pretty, like, you know, yeah, well, actually, kind of what, I, what I did is I had to basically pitch that novel with another nonfiction book to write later. Right, and yeah. you wanted to write the novel because you wanted to write it. Exactly. And at some point, you realized, maybe I'm not selling two million copies with this, but this is really important to me, and I want to write this. So why can't I do the same? Well, I'm not. I, I'm not trying to stop you. I'm just. I'm, you are. I, you're down on my links. No, I, <laughs> I. I just. I feel like I just that that people listen to these podcasts and they read your column and they're interested in these things about your life that that you don't talk about and that the other people you have podcasts with never ask you about. What about your life? Ask me about my life. Well, what's your book essays about? Um. Well, I started. It's a book I started writing when I was in Germany last year. Remember when I talked me over there? Uh, yeah, that was a fun. That was our first and only podcast yeah. from Germany. Um, it, in some ways, it's probably it's called Eating the Dinosaur, and in, in some ways, I suppose people will think it's similar to Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs because it's like it's all new essays and it's about culture. Um, but I, I, I feel, it feels much better to me. I feel like it. I've been kind of saying this jokingly, but it's kind of true. I either feel like it's the first book I've done that's good, or it's the least bad one. Well, we've we've talked about this on previous podcasts. You feel like, and in fact, I made this case to you, I feel like writers continue to get better, and then when they hit like 38 to 45, that's your, your prime, basically. Well, writing the novel definitely improved my writing vastly. Um, I think just because it was harder, and I had to sort of, uh, uh, instead of, Instead of just sort of having everything just kind of roll out all at once, I was much more deliberate in in sort of how I tried to get to certain ideas or whatnot. So when I started writing nonfiction again, uh, it seemed vastly improved. But you never know. I mean, uh, like Paul McCartney said, Flaming Pie is the best music I've ever made. So he's actually the least qualified person to judge the value of his own music. So the fact that I think this is the best book I've done doesn't mean that it is. I well, musicians, though, peak, musicians peak differently than writers, I think. Well, yeah, in certain idioms, not like in jazz. Like, don't, so, you, feel, don't you feel like if you read one of your first two books, you'd, you'd be really mad by page three, like, oh, why did I do that? Why didn't I cut that out? I would never go back and do it. I just... I think that's part of maybe you're going through this process now. I, I feel like that at some point when you write a book, there's a, peri- there's a point late in the process where you just have to abandon it. And you're not going to think about it anymore, and you're not going to go back and reread anything, and you're just going to say, I did as best as I could for this period, I, you know, and now I just have to start the new project. That's what, that's what I said before. It's like sending a kid off to college, and it's really sad to do it. And I'm actually kind of still in a funk, i got to be honest, because I mailed the book at the end of April, everything but the epilogue, and they've been copying it the last two months. And I don't know. I just feel sad. Like I, I, I feel like this is my favorite book I'm ever going to write, so then what do you do? You know, It's kind of depressing. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting feeling to have so early in your life. I know. I don't like it. I wish I didn't feel that way. But I'm sure you know. hopefully six months will pass and... And, uh, you know, I was able to throw some of that in my columns. I've been happy with the stuff I've written. And I do feel like, as you said, working on the book, you can reach a point when you work on a book where you just feel better about your writing. You're like, all right, I, this is really helping me. It's like almost hitting 10,000 tennis forehands a day or something. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think it happens more when you do the next one. I mean, when I was writing Downtown Owl, uh, I was depressed for a lot of it. And, it, it uh, you know, I, I, I had this story in my mind, and it, it was I was wasn't exactly happening on the page as it was in my mind. I mean, yeah. there are a few points in the novel where I feel like it's kind of close to what I was trying to. For the most part, I feel like it wasn't the story that I sort of wanted to do. But then when I started writing the next book, then I noticed sort of this improvement in almost the technical aspect of writing. But I would have never noticed it while it was happening. Like, while, like, like I, I, I would have never guessed when I was writing a novel that I would have gotten better at writing. 
Yeah, I felt that. It's funny you say that because I've I had like a breakthrough in February, and I was, I've been working on this book for almost two years, and there was a piece of it that wasn't coming together, and I was just starting to feel like I can't. This can't work. I can't make this work, and I was really starting to freak out, and like a chapter fell into place, and it what was, was like not just working dumb. out. I couldn't figure out how to tie everything together. But what were you writing about, I'm saying? Well, I don't want to give it away because it's a key part of the book. But there's this one theme that well, I had But it's about totally... the history of basketball. What's going to happen that's surprising? Well, it's hard to explain, but you'll know when you read the first chapter. Okay. okay. It was, But I hadn't written the first chapter yet. I did the, the book uh, not sequentially, which was, in retrospect, a giant mistake. But um, And it wasn't until I wrote the first chapter that the dominoes fell, and I just was, like, relieved, but... You know, like you said, you, you can reach a point where you just go, all right, I have this. This is what I wanted, how I wanted it to turn out. For better or worse, this is what well, I it, wanted. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's almost more like, well, I don't, I, I don't even know if the response is that clear. I mean... You just kind of know. Well, I, or, or you feel, I feel, I guess, that I just, I don't know. Like, I just, like, I don't know what else I can do here. Like, I've, I've sort of extinguished... All of the ideas I had, I've tried all the tacks that I could think of. At some point, you sort of reach your limits as a creative entity. You know yeah. that that you know that maybe a different writer, a smarter writer, or something would see more avenues or something. But sometimes I feel like you get to a point where it's you've sort of um, it's like a you know uh, it's like you're a pitcher and you're on a pitches. You know, and you yeah. think to yourself like it would be cool if I had like a you know like a, a split finger fastball here, but I don't throw that pitch. Well, that's when you reach the sending the kids out to school point. Because at some point, you just kind of, that's it. They're going. They're going to live somewhere else as freshmen. And you hope it turns out right. You hope they don't uh, overdose on a beer chug or whatever the hell's going to happen. You know? You're hoping your book doesn't overdose? <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping my book doesn't overdose. I don't know. I, I, I guess the, uh, you know, for you, you haven't done a book essays in a while. What has it been, since like 2002? Uh, that's when I wrote it, yeah. You wrote that's when six. I wrote. That's the last one I wrote. Because yeah. the fourth book was like a collection of things. I mean, when I, when I worked for Esquire, I was, I mean, I was essentially working at writing essays. But these are like long form essays. So you're not at Esquire anymore. Well, I, te- I mean, I, I still write for them. I just don't. I, 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 you know, I wrote the column for five years, like every month for five years, and I just think anybody who was a columnist, if they keep doing it. You know, if they keep, you keep, you know, like I felt like it was the, always the exact same size. So I was working in this 1300 word window, which meant if I thought like, well, okay, I'm going to write about how you know, llamas are gay or whatever, you know, yeah. I, I had to either take a long essay and move it back to 1300 words or I had to take something that was really 400 words and stretch it out. So I kind of felt limited by the size and it just sometimes seemed like, I was writing a very similar column to ones I had written in the past with just different nouns. You know, like, like I was right. writing, like I was writing, like, what is reality or whatever? Is this real? Like I was doing that with all these different things. Yeah. And I've just seen a lot of columnists who at one point uh, I, I really enjoyed. At one point it just changes, you know, and I didn't want that to happen. So what are you going to do now for your creative writing outlet? Well, um, uh, Right now, I'm kind of just in between things because I was promoting the soft cover of Downtown Owl. I've delivered Eating with Diane Sawyer, and now that's pretty much done. Like, wait I, a like, second, is it eating with? It's eating with Diane Sawyer, not eating. No, eating with, with a, dinosaur. Eat a dinosaur. Eating with like Diane, Diane Sawyer was the original title. That would have been, uh, yeah, <laughs> that would have been interesting. <laughs> I don't know if that would have sold as well. <laughs> well, if it was Eating Diane Sawyer, I think that would have been a very extremely controversial book, but. I think um, that movie was made. <laughs> it was an indie movie in 1998. The, so then you're going to promote this book. And we're going to do something. I, hopefully around the holidays. I can't do it when my thing comes out. But yeah, we're well, going to do that joint book signing thing. That would be, that would be fun. We could do but you've been doing a lot of speeches, point. though. You go like, I'll yeah. get emails from you. You're like, hey, I'm going to be over at uh, Loyola Marymount uh, giving a speech on the 19th anniversary of Hank Gather's death. Yeah, I do. Now, uh, I, I, colleges will call me up to talk, so I do a lot of that. That's sort of how, uh, I mean, it's almost like a second job now. Because that's pretty, it's fun, it's kind of lucrative, you know? See, if, if you were me and I was you, I'd be like, but 
but aren't you betraying your writing principles by just speaking and selling out for the spoken word? Well, but here's the deal. I'm not, when I give speeches at colleges, I'm not reading from my work. I'm basically right. talking, just, they're just having me sort of talking about, uh, like, abstractions in popular culture. Uh, I mean, but in a way, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's that much like the way that you get responses on Twitter, I suppose that you could argue that by going to these colleges and then taking questions from the audience, um, I'm doing the exact same thing in reality. That I'm having these people ask questions that are probably affecting the way I think about my own work. So what's your favorite thing about giving the speeches? I like, I get to see college campuses I would have never went to otherwise. I mean, I probably wouldn't have, you know, went to like, you know, Oklahoma University or whatever and saw what that campus is like or all these yeah, Ivy League schools. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting talking to college students who um, are really, really smart, but simply because of the nature of their age, haven't experienced certain things that you can sort of blow their mind with. Right. That, you know, there are these people who are, they're, you know, they're 20 or 21 and they're, they're really smart and they're really engaged in culture, but because they were born, um, you know, like, I guess now what, in ni- sometimes 1990 or whatever, you know, and, yeah. and they, that there's just all these things that, that, uh, that they probably haven't uh, been introduced to. And, and it's interesting to see, I feel like it kind of keeps me aware of what, Young people are what's important to them and what's interesting to them, you know. But you're only getting a small sample of those people. I am, I know. But the thing is, the kind of people who come to these things are essentially the people buying my books. So I don't feel like I'm expanding my audience outside of where it would normally be. Because the only Mm. people, because it's free for the students. So what kind of like, when you were in college and somebody was coming on campus to speak and it was free, how often did you go? Um, depending on who it was, I, but I went to a college where we had the worst possible people we were like coming up, sister, Mary Catherine Gallagher talks about, uh, Roe versus Wade free down in the, you know, stuff like that. So it wasn't, uh, wasn't stuff in my wheelhouse. We didn't exactly have like David Letterman showing up talking about his late night show. But is it weird for you though? Cause I remember when I was right after college, I went to this Red Sox event. It, at Harvard, in Cambridge, the Harvard campus in Cambridge, and it was like different baseball writers, and one of the guys there was Roger Angel, who is one of my favorite writers ever, and I'd read his books, and just, he, just he meant a lot to me, and I met him, and I met him for, you know, talked to him for three minutes, and he signed my book, and I was just over the moon for like two weeks. Is it weird to you that you might have people that come to your things like that and feel the same way? Oh, extremely weird. I mean, it's, I, I don't know if anyone ever gets used to that. I mean, it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens sometimes. I'd be lying to say it never happens. Um, and it's extremely flattering when it happens, but it's very weird. You feel very confused about people you felt that way about. Yeah, like you're talking about this yeah. guy. Now you, now you have been in a similar position. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, it, it kind of just changes your whole concept of, of idolatry and all that stuff. You know, it, it's, it's very, it's very confusing because also you have to, you know, it's, uh, I think, a pro- like a mistake some people make is that if they achieve any degree of notoriety, they then constantly surround themselves by people who remind them of that. And that's where they get sort of this misplaced sense of self. The Bubby, the Bubble Hill Syndrome? Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Well, I mean, just that, that's one, but I think just... Uh, uh, at least he was authentically famous. I think yeah. this now happens with people who are barely famous. You know, um, um, somebody has a, you know, a blog writer or something, and that they start getting a lot of responses to their work, so they befriend these people, and they become their online friends. And then those online friends transfer to be their real friends. So they're constantly living in this world where they're a public figure. And I think that it confuses about, I think they get very confused about the, what the value of what they're doing actually is. Because as far as they can tell, everybody they talk to treats them as if they're some sort of public intellectual. Hmm. Wow, you just, that was good. That might have been your best moment of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like there's like some sort of syndrome. Like, oh. Not like Munchausen, but something that could be some sort of similar word that could apply for that scenario. Well, I mean, this this all happened, this really started in the late 90s, because 
memoir writing became the dominant form of literature, of nonfiction literature. And really, memoirs are just autobiographies about non-famous people. Yeah. And then reality television became like the most uh, popular form of TV. So people were seeing people on television who maybe they didn't necessarily want to be like, but they felt absolutely no separation from. And then the Internet sort of was already in existence, but then that really, really exploded kind of, I think, as an extension of those other two entities. And now people are very confused about what the level of celebrity is. Because, <laughs> Including but, myself. Well, it is, no, it's a, I, I, I got to admit, I'm, I'm always interested in how you sort of manage this. Because of the oh, no, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about, like, you read about the, uh, the Real World Road Rose Challenge guys, and you'll see it. Like, come to Austin, Texas tonight. We'll have Siobhan from Real World Australia. Oh, yeah. I mean, if I... It's amazing to me that, they, that Siobhan would attract people to come to a bar that they might not normally come to. Well, I mean, and they're, they're a particularly interesting class of person. Like, it would blow my mind to see CT on a subway. <laughs> Much more so than it would be if I saw Philip Roth, in a way. <laughs> or David Wright. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of weird. Would it's, you be more excited for CT or Philip Roth? If I saw Philip Roth, um, well, well here's, here's a big difference. If I saw Philip Roth, um, there would be part of me that, first of all, I'm not really sure it's him. Okay? And if it was him, if I was convinced it was him, I would never possibly talk to him. Yeah. Um, because you know, and I would, uh, if anything, I would sort of be a, uh, a you know, a nervous. I mean, I would feel like I wouldn't. I wouldn't say I would be scared, but I would feel. I would certainly feel nervous enough not to have any interaction with him. But if I saw CT, I would not feel that way. And even if I didn't say anything to him, because I probably wouldn't, unless it was sort of a, unless it was like a natural situation. I yeah. can definitely think of many more people who I would want to tell about this. You know, yeah. and I would be much more interested in what he seemed to be acting like if it matched sort of the way he is depicted on the show in accordance to how he is depicted in the reunion shows and when he actually acts like himself. Um, what do you think is the worst type of person who's ever approached you? Like for me, it's like it's cut and dry, and this only happened a couple of times. But people who come up with their cell phone, they're like, "Can you just? I just want to call my buddy. I just want you to say hello to him." I think that, to me, is the most awkward thing that could happen. It's, you know, it's, it's a tough thing to talk about because I don't want to ever express somehow that this is a burden. I mean, because when you think about it, it's really the trade-off for, like, being able to have a big TV or whatever and having your work read by people and sort of feeling as though these ideas you had are valuable. So, but, you know... Uh, I'm not saying yeah. it's a burden at all. I'm not, not yeah. even remotely. I just think it's rude. Well, it is, it is. It's weird. It's strange. I think, particularly, like I suppose, to be honest, like in the comparison of like Philip Roth and CT, I'm probably perceived closer to like CT, <laughs> so that when someone sees me, that they would not feel any sort of uh, apprehension to go up and just you know uh, 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 introduce themselves to me, call me by my first name, having never met me before. And uh, sort of kind of imagine that we already have a relationship. That, I guess, is, I don't know if this, is, this really answers your question, but it does feel strange sometimes when, because people have read stuff you've written, they feel that they really do know you. you know, I, love, I love meeting people. I think when, when you're, as you're meeting them, as they're handing you a cell phone telling you to talk to a third person, that's weird. Well, that's true. Although I do think to myself, it's like that... It, I don't know. I mean, that's that's a pretty flattering thing, though, when you think about it. That they that they imagine that someone else in their life, this is going to you know make their night. Or maybe they don't. I mean, maybe they just maybe they maybe it's a, almost a way of of mocking someone by having them do that. I don't know. And, and as I say this, my mom's probably one of her top three favorite actors is James Spader. Uh huh. And I was downtown the other day and saw him. And he was carrying a kid, and 50% of me wanted to just grab him and ask him if he'd take a cell phone picture of me. And I was going to mail it to my mom. And I really thought about it, and then I was like, oh, my God. I would, you know, that, that, that's like, I would hate if somebody did that to me or anybody I know. But, but part of me, it was, I was dying. My mom would have been so excited to picture me and James Spader. So I do get it. Well, you know what I mean? I, I think what the, the, the more interesting thing to me is how, like, and, and this is, uh, you know, you write a book or I suppose if you make a record or you make a movie, whatever you do, um, for a lot of people, they're going to be experiencing that 
years after you've actually worked on it, but you're still going to be that person. Yeah. Like, you know, there, there, are, there are a lot of people who will say, like, read Fugger Rock City, which I wrote really in, like, the late 90s about how I was in the 80s, and they will just immediately start asking me questions about, like, you know, am I going to see rats on this tour or, or you know, these, these... And they'll ask me also specific things about the book, which I haven't looked at in 10 years, but they just read it. So for them, it's the present tense. Like they've, like, they've just thought of this, and they try to ask me things that... That's it's interesting. It's hard to answer the question, you know? Yeah. Because I, like, they're, they're actually much more aware of what's in the book in some ways than I am. I would think that would be weirder for a musician if you had, like, one hit album, but then, like, 12 years passed. I, I hate to use the vanilla ice analogy because it's cliche, but somebody, like, uh, I don't know, the Counting Crows. Like, they've had a pretty good career after the first album, but the first album was the most famous. But if somebody went up to Adam Duritz and was just like, yeah, man, Mr. Jones, and it begins. And but, Adam Duritz but, is thinking, yeah, I've done a lot of stuff since then. But, yeah, yeah well, but he, it's even probably more so for somebody like Mick Jagger who gets asked about things he did in his 20s, and now he's in his, what, 60s, you know, and, and people will still sort of ask him, like, you know, pretty upfront, straightforward questions about Jigsaw Puzzle or whatever, and I, he's got to be like, you've thought about this song so much more than I have. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. the, there's a flip side of this, though, is the celebrity that doesn't want to let go of their great achievement 30 years ago, and I would say Francis Ford Coppola is the best one, like, has anybody milked more out of a movie that came out 35 years ago than him? It's still coming out in new versions of Blu-ray that haven't been invented yet. He's still doing podcasts and radio shows. And, you know, and meanwhile, he hasn't had a good movie in 20 years. But the, it's like The Godfather's present tense to people. Well, yeah, that is. And I mean, and, and that's also, you know, a situation where he's arguably made the best American movie ever. Yes. So, I mean, so I suppose he feels a certain sort of historical pressure to keep talking about. I mean, it's, Oh, no, I think he yeah. likes talking about it. And well, I probably would, too, if I made The Godfather. But you never... No, nobody ever... When they're interviewing him, nobody ever goes, Sofia Coppola, what the hell were you thinking? You know, none of those questions are ever asked. What made you think a, an 80s musical was going to work? What was that movie called? Oh, uh, we were just talking about it the other night. Oddly, it was awful. I, I, but I, I don't... Yeah. I've never even seen it. But Yeah, you know, it was bad. But yeah, they, but I always think those kind of celebrities are funny too. The the guy that there's a Muhammad Ali bi biographer, Thomas Hauser, mm -hmm. and if you're doing an, a documentary about Ali, like he has some sort of radar goes off, and he'll find you. He'll find your house and your camera crew, and he's ready, and he'll sit down and he'll do his Ali spiel, and he does the thing about Frazier and Ali that third fight. It was about the championship of each other. Like he's just ready to go. Doesn't well, I, matter what the context is. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is a certain kind of person who is really feels like, well, here's the choice. I can be known for this one thing or I can be known for nothing. So I'm going to take this one thing and it's going to be my identity so that people will not separate me from this event, this artist, you know, uh, um, uh, this sort of writing or whatever, you know. Um, and that just, you know, and that, that definitely changes who they are because I think that they start viewing themselves continually through this one piece of work. You know? If I had to pick any book for you to write, that would be a change of pace from stuff you've done. I've always wanted somebody to write this book. A year in the life of these reality stars after they're on the show in that weird circuit, that party circuit well, of... There was a guy for, for GQ, and I, his name is like John Jeremiah Sullivan or something. He wrote yeah. a story about sort of the culture of, of like past real world people living in LA. And I was, I have to admit, I was extremely envious when I read the story. I would have loved to do that story. Oh my um, God. I didn't I know would, about this. Yeah. Um, and well, he didn't, he actually, like, uh, he's a very, very good writer. Um, I don't know how authentically interested he was in these people going into it. Like, I think he became interested, but I think that, uh, you know, I, that is one kind of idiom of the reality world that I want to know more about those Me too. people. And MTV does a really interesting thing. I don't know if they're doing this on purpose or if it's just kind of mismanagement that ends up to their benefit. You watch the entire season of the challenge, and it's really entertaining, and it's really fun to watch. And then they show those last two episodes, the one that's like the stuff they should have shown us, yeah. and the reunion show. And it's 
infinitely more interesting to see how these people actually are and to hear about all the things that are happening outside of the show. Yes. For some reason, their production philosophy is that we're not going to ever go outside of events that are happening here in New Zealand or whatever. So you never hear the backstories about these relationships going outside of it. And that's really the interesting part. But I wonder if it works to its benefit. I wonder if the entire season was like those last two episodes, if over time I would lose interest. This actually keeps me much more interested because I just can't sort of... I mean, they seem to be living a life that uh, not only have I not imagined, I think was unimaginable even 10 years ago. Well, I think the most interesting guy is Evan because Evan was a guy who was a fresh meat cast member who was basically a fan who got on the show who these guys were like idols to him, and now he walks among his idols on this show. That's the guy who has always fascinated well, me the most. And the guy who has now achieved... He is, he is among, of the people there, he is in some ways the most trained to doing what the show wants him to do. Exactly. He will sit in the confessional and give all of the expository details. Like he, It's almost like he works for the show itself. I mean, he does, I guess. I mean, that's, yeah. that's like his, his life now. Um, it would be like somebody who watched ESPN for 20 years, trained himself to think like a, like a successful talking head on all the shows would think, and then went on and was like the best guy at it. But he did it, it but he was the best guy because he put so much thought into what worked and what didn't work. But the weird part is that he's on a reality show. Like, it's not like, you know, he's put more thought into this probably than anybody in the history of mankind. I have, I have also, like, I, I used to never think this would be the case, but I, I have to admit, now I kind of wish one time MTV really went for it and that the prize was a million dollars, winner take all, and they got all of us, everybody back who was, who actually, because like, like, you know, Landon and Evan and CT and Elton, who was this sort of amazing athlete. Yeah. And, you know, um, well, don't forget the Miz. Maybe, now, maybe the Miz will come back. Um, yeah. I feel that one dude who played wide receiver for Tennessee is a bad reflection on SEC football, though. <laughs> yeah, Shouldn't he be dominating all of these things? I, mean, I agree. It kind of makes me think that maybe the SEC is, you know, not this power conference. But, but anyway, get all these people back and all the really talented women back, like, you know, like, you know, all the lesbians. Like, throw Coral back in there to mix things up and let them play for a million dollars each, and all they eat is rice and booze. And just wow. see kind of what happens. And make the, you know, make the challenges really physical. Because those guys, man, I, I mean, I... I I mean, I'm sure, I know you've talked about this. Like, it, it seems clear that, like, that there is pretty extensive performance-enhancing drugs. Mitchell Report? Yeah. Yeah. There's, There's no Mitchell way. Report, yeah. yeah. But, but it's good. I mean, they shouldn't test those guys. I mean, CT should not be tested for anything. That guy, uh, one of my favorites ever, Isaac, as after he got voted off, he basically said that. He's like, in 18 months, I'll be back and I'll be doing the same stuff these other guys are doing and I'll be a force to be reckoned with. And the implication was clear. <laughs> Watch out for Isaac at the uh, well, Gold's Gym events. Well, looking. And, I, and I could tell that, that the producers realized that this guy is a funny guy. Like, we need to make him emerge as more of a character. So yeah. his, like... His description of things, you know, he wasn't a very big character in the season, but I think that he's going to, they're kind of priming him to be a new Miz. Kind of. I want somebody to delve into that world. The three great books that haven't been written for whatever reason are that nobody's really done the definitive 600 page porn book of just exactly what happens in this industry. Well, Legs McNeil did. Legs McNeil did oral history of It porn. was bad, though. It wasn't good. Well, did I you know. you think it was good? It wasn't good. It was an oral history. It wasn't good. I want, for, like, a real for, writer. For an oral history, that was, because oral histories tend to be interesting no matter what the subject, and that was, I suppose, somewhat disappointing. But well, see, if I, you I read my... I think it would be interesting to do a book on if just writing sort of uh, one kind of reported essay and sort of interview with every person who's ever been on the real world now. I mean, I know oh, how many people, you know, that, that you just sort of talk about how it changed their life and, and what, you know, uh, what their life is like now and what they think about, but, you know. And there's never been, like, the definitive pro wrestling book, which is bizarre. You know, well, yeah, no, well, that, no, no great me, that, that ever seems like in. a book that you would, do, you would be very well suited to write. That you would know. have a pretty good sense of the of the of what parts of it are uh, uh, authentic, what parts of it are fake, what parts are legitimately interesting, what parts get exaggerated by the media. Charles, everything. I don't think it would be that good of a book. I kind of feel like the window passed. Well, it would have to be an, it would have to be unauthorized. There's no question about that. Yeah, that I mean, if they did an authorized book, it would be awful. Well, Chuck Klosterman, um, this podcast weighed in at about 
it looks like an hour and 25 minutes almost. Are, are the, you going to have to break it up in two parts again? It was the equivalent of a 700-page book I wrote <laughs> <laughs> that you made fun of. <laughs> no, I, you know, I always feel at the end of these podcasts, I feel as though you perceive me as having attacked you, and I'm just trying to get at the real Bill Simmons. Oh, uh, you're, you're a crap yeah. stirrer. <laughs> you like stirring. I know what you're up to, close to me. Um, well, we'll have you on. Hopefully, there's another impetus. We should have had you on sooner. The Michael Jackson thing made me realize, oh, my God, we haven't had Chuck on in a while. Um, and I'm glad we kind of hashed that out a little bit. But good luck with the book, and we'll talk to you hopefully later in the summer. Talk to you later, man. All right, bye. Target the sun off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Two more. Bye. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. That concludes, ends, finishes, wraps up another BS report. With all the talk about baseball, the upcoming football season, and hockey playoffs, Bill Simmons neglected to mention something which, frankly, cannot go unstated. Okay? Here goes. <clears throat> For a limited time, hurry into Subway and enjoy the new Tuscan chicken melt. Lovely seasoned chicken, melted bubbly cheese with olive vinaigrette. Piled so high with the crisp veggies you love on your choice of freshly baked bread. All that deliciousness with 9 grams of fat. It's part of a fresh fit meal.